Video games. What up, dudes, and welcome back to the Yo Video Games Podcast. I'm Matt. And I'm Andrew. And once again, thank you to all our generous patrons who've kept us going for over 350 episodes. Some would say too many episodes. But yeah, if you're interested in becoming a patron at any level, please check out patreon.com slash EO Video Games Podcast. Dude of the week is Neo Meister. Thank you, Neo Meister. Thank you, Neo. Or Neo Meister. It's M A I. M E I would be Meister, mm-hmm. right? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> if you're if you're German, E I is Meister. Are we are we gonna have our own Mandela effect moment here? I think we're gonna have we're gonna Bear, have Bears Bernstein 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 Bears. Yeah, isn't it Barons? It's Bernstein. 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 Well, no shit. one knows. No one, no one knows the real thing. It's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. But it is not a mystery that we have a sponsor to thank. <clears throat> now, it is free ball fall. And That's right, and it's coming up on 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 a, a it's fresh you know, ball Christmas. Fall. It's fresh ball. You keep saying free ball fall. You <laughs> really, know. really just want to walk around with your balls hanging out, don't you? I sort of do, honestly. You know, free the nipple. Let's just free the nuts. No, that'd be weird. Nobody <laughs> wants to see a nut sack. Nut sacks are mostly upsetting. You Actually, ever seen? You ever seen an unneutered Great Dane? <laughs> Because this is what I'm picturing. <laughs> My dog, before he got neutered, he was like six or seven months old, and his nuts was like half his mass. <laughs> fucking, I remember you telling me that. It was Doug and his nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Uh, but it is the perfect time of year to get more involved with your nuggets. Of course, right, our sponsor... Is Manscaped. Manscaped. And, uh, you know, you, you want to, you know, Halloween's over. So now it's all about getting ready, you know, for trimming the tree and decking the halls, you know, with your balls. Decking so the ball. make sure that your forest is nice and trimmed and ready to go for that, you know, special Christmas season. You never the want the best way to keep bush, your tree definitely. trimmed is the lawnmower 4.0. Lawnmower 4.0. But of course, it's one of our favorite products. But we also have a couple of other favorites. Uh, the crop preserver. Good Keep old those crop preserver. Fresh. Yeah, you get that for an after shower uh, deodorant for your nuts. And then there's an anytime spray for the crop reviver, uh, which, which is the spray on, which is not an excuse for replacing a whole shower. I know who you are, Smash players and convention goers. Um, it does live in my gym bag, though, along with crop. It's for the gym. It's for the gym. And then, of course, our loungewear. When we're not doing free ball uh, fall, yeah, which is I'm the box 2.0. Right now. Show them off. I know you're not wearing pants. Um, <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> but they are truly comfortable. We do very much love these products. So if you're interested in checking them out, please head over to manscaped.com. Use our code YOVG, all caps, for 20% off and free shipping worldwide. That's YOVG, all caps, at manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping worldwide. Your balls will thank you. Jingle, jingle. Jingle, jangle. Jingle, jangle. If your balls are jingle, jangling, you got other problems. <laughs> <laughs> you know i uh i i did want to try and work some sort of mistletoe reference in there but i couldn't I couldn't Ooh. think about like a berries but then twiggin, your ber- twi- mistletoe twiggin is berries. poisonous and yeah. you don't want people you, nobody wants to kiss under nuts i don't know unless you're at an orgy <laughs> and i'm just thinking of the ending to that that movie uh f- not food fight um sausage party <laughs> yes oh. yes yeah uh, which, by the way, is getting an eight-episode series now with most of the cast returning. But somehow, why? I don't know. <laughs> that's a that's a movie that took forever to get made, and then you know was a smash hit for some weird fucking reason, and then now is getting a lot of the animators didn't get paid. And... Yeah, it was, I mean, it was a fucking mess. That movie <laughs> was just ridiculous. But it is like one of the only R-rated movies that's ever been out here, like in a, in a wide release of any sort. Um, yeah, that's true. There's not a lot of animated R-rated movies in the no. States. You know what? It's funny. And a lot of people don't know this. They don't realize how different the seventies was. Do you know like what one of the highest grossing films of the year it came out in was Fritz the cat? Yeah. And that was a fucked up animated movie. It's an X rated. That's X. That's NC 17. Yeah. Now. It was an X rated 
uh, animated film in theaters, and it was one of the highest grossing films of the whole year it came out in. People were desperate to see titties. <laughs> you know, nowadays we take it for granted, but we have a lot of really wonderful people that are willing to just show you their titties and or balls. I don't know if you're into that, but the point is you can see genitalia almost on demand, actually definitely on demand. Uh, and in some places it's a problem, but <laughs> in the seventies, maybe you had to see the adventures of an animated cat to see some animated titties, you know, things were it's, different. It's, it was a different time. It's weird too. Cause then there was like that thing. I don't know if you saw it where there was an interview with, uh, Bob Chapek, and here goes any sponsorship with that company. But like, man, this guy is wildly out of touch. Where he's just like, yeah, like, the, the parents watch one of our great animated movies, and when the kids go to bed, you know, the parents are gonna watch something for them. You know, it's not gonna be an animated film. And I'm like, Ooh, Bob, I'm like, clearly he doesn't know Disney adults. No, he like one, he doesn't know crazy Disney fandom at all. Even though they're he's all the head of the fucking company. Um, they're all in their forties and fifties. Secondly, like what a way to throw, what a way to throw all the animation, you know, people, animators, writers, directors under the bus, right? you know, like minimize, you know, their importance or whatever. What a way to carp, 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 blah, 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 blah. I'm literally tongue twisting on this, but like put it in a You're compartment. A stroke. Live. Right. Right. Compartmentalize. Compartmentalize. And then an enemy. And then an enemy. Put it like that into animation into, into a, into a single genre, which Guillermo del Toro just immediately you know, said on the red carpet for Pinocchio about how he was fighting against that. Right. Um, you know, and, and, and it's also to me, it, it's, it's a real slap in the face to like Walt because like Walt hated the fact, not really hated the fact, but like Walt lamented, that's a good word, lamented the fact that he kind of created a, a stereotype for animation and films. Oh, right. Yeah. I remember the, it, it, there's a, there's a quote by him about it, right? Yeah, he went. I think it was he went to go see To Kill a Mockingbird. I think it was that movie. Right, and he was Might like, been, I, "I will never make something." Yeah, like it's that. like I could. And he said he and, and his, he was very upset coming home when his wife was like, well, "What's the problem?" Like, was it a bad movie? He's like, "No, it was excellent." And what's the problem? Because I know I can never make that movie. Mm. Like, like he knew he could never. He, like he said, like it, w through animation, it's like I can never make this film. Um, have you ever thought of a? Or have you ever seen a movie and you're like, God, I just. I'll never get to make that movie now. Like that's that movie's been made and it like connected with you on such a level. It's, that you're it's just not like, okay. Oh. Well, not, not in a sense of like, Oh, I really think I could ever get into like, you know, hundred million dollar filmmaking or anything, but Blade Runner 2049. Yeah. Like it just was absolutely you, just... that film. I was like, fuck, I wish I could, I wish I made this film. <laughs> like, I wish, I wish this was me. I wish like it's a, in the film was a fucking flop, but it's like, man, I would, I would kill you know, to, to be Denny, Denny Veneau and have that as, you know, my, my resume. I'm like, these are the films you've made. Like was, Blade Runner 2049. Oh, it was a financial failure, bro. It's Blade Runner 2049. Yeah. And in 20 years, like they'll be remaking it because it's one of the greatest films. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they know they're doing a live series for Amazon 2099. That's what I heard, but I don't know how that's going to be. Mm -hmm. I sort of love movies like that where it's like, you almost feel grief because it was so good yeah. or, or like maybe it's not even good. It doesn't even have to be good. Right. It, it just like, it has to hit you and like what you were looking for mm -hmm. and your style, especially because I know we have, uh, you know, filmmakers and film students that listen to the podcast. Like y'all know what I'm talking about. You'll see a movie <laughs> and you're like, Oh, I'll never get to make that now. And it hit, exactly what i want to do one of the hardest things about doing anything creative is like having better taste than your skills allow mm. uh you know as you're building up like yeah yeah, um, yeah. you know the whole idea of you got to make so many short films before you start making something good is like you want you know what a good thing is but you just can't whatever because of budget because of time because mm -hmm. of access to actors or effects or whatever like you just can't get it perfect because of whatever reason and yeah. you end up mourning like these perfect movies movies mm -hmm. that were perfect for you at the time um and, and i and i actually like films that aren't necessarily aren't even perfect so oh, to sure. speak yeah. um i still feel like that's why i love john carpenter 
uh, yeah, from like a writing, directing, and acting standpoint, I know there's a debate about like casting, you know, and and you know, you know, racial casting and whatever, but um, I still feel like the thing I would be like one of the most things I'd be most proud of uh, would be Cloud Atlas. We've talked about it before. Oh, yeah. I think he got brought up recently too, where someone asked Tom Hanks what was top three or top five films that he's been in was. And he said he's, he wouldn't give the full list, but he said Cloud Atlas was one of them. Yeah. Um, because like, as an, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, as an actor, you, I would, if I look at that, I'm like, you're going to do. He was like, I know, made, I've made three good films and Cloud Atlas is one is, of them. Yeah. I made three good films and Cloud Atlas is one of them. That's what he's, yeah, that was even crazier. Cause it was yeah. like all the films he's been in. He's like, I've been in three good films. <laughs> like I've been three great films. And he's like, I think it was something like, yeah, I've been in three great films great films yeah you know and i've been in a couple of okay you know ones and a lot of them uh, <laughs> and he's like cloud alice is one of them um, right which i which i agree with because like oh, god i would could you imagine being just like okay looking at like the script and just being like you're gonna we're gonna do you know a period piece south pacific you know abolitionist thing and then we're gonna do a 70s thing we're gonna do a modern day thing we're gonna do a, a future futurist thing. a futuristic you know hyper sci-fi thing we're going to do post-apocalyptic you know in hawaii like well i think like if you ever needed to be convinced one that tom hanks is a good actor i mean if you need to be convinced at this point that tom hanks is a good actor where have you been but um cloud atlas is you can see him play disparate characters very quickly back to back to back and each one of them are unique and memorable like a lot of the times with especially uh, A-list stars, they're not playing characters. They're just themselves in a different hat kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's actually, mm -hmm. from a marketing perspective, that's what you want. You want people to go like, ah, yes, I know Brad Pitt. I know he's entertaining, and I like to look at Brad Pitt, so he's going to play this thing. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. That's true, yeah. right? Like, um, you know, you, nobody's, uh, nobody's going to argue... Um, that a character actor is someone that you go see because you love to look at them. But character actors very often are memorable because they end up diving in mm -hmm. so deep. They end up becoming like the glue of the movie. Um, but they don't get A-list status because, you know, they're not model-esque or it's not even necessarily yeah. model-esque. It's, it's a lot of the time is like they do something that's, charming or whatever there's charisma and charisma doesn't necessarily mean good looks charisma can just be right. like you just enjoy seeing this character talk on screen even if they may not even be the best looking character like danny devito right like, danny devito is very charismatic yeah sorry, so, you know I'm, i don't mean to slight the guy but it's just like danny devito is very charismatic danny devito yeah, he's is not, not traditionally he's handsome he's not winning you know right. you know best looking guy of the year award for any year so. Well, I, I like to put it like this. Stanley Tucci. Stanley Tucci is mm -hmm. one. He's a good looking dude. It's like every year he gets older, he becomes more daddy esque. It's ridiculous. Um, but Stanley Tucci is pretty much Stanley Tucci in every single movie that he's in. He's doing Stanley Tucci as this. Stanley Tucci as that. And it's not that he's doing a bad job. It's just that he is so charming that you don't care that you know it's just him mm -hmm. doing the thing, right? Daniel Day-Lewis, you don't think it's Daniel Day-Lewis the whole goddamn time you watch him. Still charming, still does interesting stuff, but he completely falls into, um, you know, a character. And, and, and he would kind be considered of, a list. And there's kind of like that a bit with, and I think he's a good actor. He definitely has, I'm not saying he doesn't have range, but it's like Jeff Bridges kind of falls into that a little bit where... Yeah, he can play very different characters, but like it's still Jeff Bridges. You kind of do like, oh, it's Jeff Bridges, but pissed off. It's Jeff mm -hmm. Bridges, but like punished. It's Jeff Bridges, but he's lazy. It's, you know, it's right. Jeff Bridges, but he's you know maybe maybe like you know uh, eccentric genius or something, right? But um, um, yeah, well, I I think really good actors. Uh, the reason you get lost in it is that they're just so fun to watch perform. Right. I mean, yeah. I, I like to say Ben Foster is kind of my favorite actor that's not getting nearly enough mm. attention. He's sort of every time you see him in something, he's just great, but he never like he never just had that moment. You know, I don't know. I don't know if you know who Ben Foster is. No, but... I don't think so. I, mean, I think I've heard the name, but I don't 
There's nothing that's immediately springing to mind. He he got really he got attention for thirty days of night where he mm. uh he's the prisoner who wants raw meat. Uh, in in the prison, he's the herald mm. of the vampires coming. He uh did Hell or High Water, uh, Three Ten to Yuma. He's the right hand man of the uh, bad okay. guy. Three Ten to Yuma. Uh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. He's just sort of great mm-hmm. in everything he does, but he never quite like. I think Pandorum was his first real shot at being main character, and it didn't mm. do well, so it sort of stymied his um his climb. But he is the go to like guy to put really good actors against mm-hmm. because he can hold his own ah. um but i i know we got we got kind of sidetracked because we're working towards talking about endings endings um and i guess the way to transition into that is uh everybody's favorite controversy bayonetta 3 well here's the thing i, I want to say this just sort of like anyone who's kind of been listening and maybe want, this is a spoiler mode podcast oh like, yeah that's like fair. straight up we're, we're going to any, you know, the games we talk about will obviously be spoilers for the endings of these games because we're talking about franchises like ending gracefully or not ending gracefully most right. of the time. Um, so this is a spoiler ish podcast. This Video games podcast. really don't get a lot of opportunities to end gracefully because there's very seldom yeah. that a company is going to let you just wrap it up. They want to leave the option open in case it's a big hit. Yeah. So, um, very much so. But Bayonetta 3, spoilers for that. Uh, and there's, it, it seems like Bayo 3 has had uh, just a rough few weeks. Um, Helena the Taylor, is... she's nuts. <laughs> she's nuts. Um, um, sure good. seems like, sure seems like she's not. I, you know, the thing is, is I, I really wanted to take her side uh, right away. Um and I think I got misconstrued because I was saying Kami is acting like a dick to people. So I think that's why he's getting the harassment he was getting. Um, it wasn't so much that I think Kamiya was the guy who made the decision behind whatever. But it also turns out that Helen Taylor's uh, sort of wildly... <laughs> if she's not intentionally lying, if she wasn't intentionally lying, she's... So it was def- it was definitely lying by omission. It seemed like, and then yeah. she owned then she owned up to it, which in is a weird help her case. Well, she she um, owned up to it in like a no no I said this kind of. She tried to like gaslight the internet. Yeah, <laughs> she just I don't know. It was a wild. It was a she wild. Gaslight the internet like cyberpunk anime. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? I tried Making you think that game was good. I didn't. <laughs> I went back and played it, and it's just—it's not bad. It doesn't hook. It still doesn't hook me very well. But I—I I did. Yeah, that was—that was kind of what we told, and Steve agreed with us too. Where we're like, here's the problem with with going back to Cyberpunk, even if it functions now, it's just a bit. It's just—it's just a very basic video game. It's like you it's do things, is. you do things that you do in in a million other games you've already done. Like you're not. It's it's the we settings really... kind of unique, I guess. But like it's it's not. It's not what you thought it was. It's, it's we got nothing... a really good comment about it though, where, uh, and I'm sorry that I'm forgetting your name, dude. Uh, whoever it was, but basically they were kind of like the point of cyberpunk isn't, you know, it's nobody leaves Night City, like nobody survives the cyberpunk yeah. world. Is the whole point of cyberpunk 2077? Um, and I guess that's fair, and it does drive that point home repeatedly. Um, just i i don't know it has it didn't hook me is all i'm gonna yeah. give give to it maybe when dlc pops out a lot of people it. are liking it like people who've gone back to play it oh yeah after the oh anime. it runs way better yeah and people are I enjoying played... it i'm not gonna and i'm not gonna say like i'm definitively saying this game is not that fun it's it's definitely not that fun for me oh no it just and, didn't and, hook and me. i know for other people yeah. it's also kind of like eh, it's okay there are a lot of people who are really enjoying the shit out of it, though. So I... the main story is interesting, and there was a lot of set pieces mm-hmm. uh, that I thought were really fucking cool. I just, like I said, like I didn't care. Uh, okay, actually, the main story is cool. Uh, I just didn't really get hooked on doing any of the side quest shit. Mm. I didn't care about getting any of the weapons and like hunting things out. Like I didn't give a shit about any of that. <laughs> side questing was... is going to become a really weird thing for me going forward because. Xenoblade 3 came out this year. And to me, this was like this was your Citizen Kane moment of side questing. 
to the point of like, why wasn't this in the main game? This is so good. And it feels yeah, well, why, why, what is the rosebud of that game then? The rosebud? Like what's the sled? Yeah. What's, what's the rosebud of that game? Well, what do you consider the rosebud necessarily? I'm trying to like, I first I have to understand what you mean. What the do hook. you consider rosebud? The hook, the, the deep hook of citizen Kane. What's the hook of the game? The yeah. hook of the game is, is basically ending the proxy war. Um, okay. And so everything, and that's kind of like the thing about that game is how Rose every side book. quest is related in one way or to another about this central conflict that you know very early on. It's 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 all proxy war. Like you're 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 fighting a war. You and this other nation have been fighting right. pointlessly for fucking eons, kind of thing. Um, but every side quest is basically looking at a different facet of that, like people at different ranks, you know, soldiers, commanders, and people who've had different experiences, people with different, you know, basically all this, just everything and everything around this idea of, of this scenario. Love um, it when they stay on theme. One of the hardest things though, is that if your theme is too dour or just like, I don't know, you know, when a theme is like too much of a downer and so they just mm -hmm. keep driving at home and they don't explore anything else and i think the game oh. does sometimes get a little little too far and it was funny because everyone's like it's such an emotionally i was so impacted and i'm like every, the, the the big scene but everyone starts like says like they lost their shit and were bawling their eyes out i was like this is i'm like get on with it <laughs> i was kind of like you're the really dragging i'm like you're really dragging this 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 sour note out yes i like to me i'm like i get it it's sad why is this going on for 10 more minutes <laughs> how dare you you love a sour note I do, but like you it's do. it's it was like clearly not the end of the game, and like the payoff was great, you know, for for anyone. We're in spoiler mode or whatever, so there's a point in the in the with like two thirds into Xenoblade Three, where you get captured and taken to jail. Um, you know that the one main character is terminal, right? Everyone dies right. when they hit twenty. She's two months, like a month away or two months away. I think she's like a month away from from literally dying. So the main villain beats you in a battle and he just goes, I have a great idea. I'm going to like make you sit in jail and watch her die. So he decides to like let you rot in jail for a whole month and then drag you out and publicly watch, you know, the main, your main character die, this main girl die. Doesn't and it's hurt. dragged and I'm like, and I'm like, it's so dragged out too. I'm like, okay. I'm like, first of all, I don't know why the fuck this, this main character wants to just because he's basically more or less been alive for like thousands of years at this point. I don't know why he, personally gives any amount of shit to like dragging this this scenario out when he could have just cunt. when he could have just chopped you up right then and there so much um, so much can be just he's a cunt he's a cunt yeah he is i'm like it doesn't it doesn't to me i'm like it doesn't pay off like i'm like i do like the fact because the thing is is that you're you're basically more or less a clone of him and the girl mio's a clone of his of that. his wife right but his wife has this ability to to literally like s switch places mentally. Like she can literally like switch consciousnesses and bodies. And so what you find out, and it's pretty cool. The payoff's great because you find out as the character's dying in front of everyone that it the the main villain's wife had switched switched minds with the person dying because she was so sick of being alive for so long. And being part of this proxy and like in keeping this proxy war going, she was so sick of being, you know, just eternity got to her. And so she wanted to die and it fucking causes the main villain to like lose his fucking brain. Like, um, it's yeah, pretty good. Pay jaw ruled him, bamboozled him straight <laughs> bamboozled up. Him. It's a really, that payoff is fantastic, but there's this 10 minutes of drag out with like a slim, maybe not 10, but like a close to 10 of them just basically being in prison and trying to escape and not being able to escape. And like a, the sad song playing and they're just trapped. And I'm like, this is drawn out too long. Fucking Christ. Like <laughs> if I have to feel for one more, fucking <laughs> I'm like, so yeah, we're in spoiler mode, but yeah, like I thought them like when that happens, when like he sits there and looks over and he realizes who's dying, that, that, you know, that that's been going on. He literally, and he has like this like actual mental breakdown huge uh Her henry mccallister henry mccallister i'm forgetting his name um huge props to the voice actor for for basically like fucking like when the main like the main villain just like fucking like loses his mind and just he literally breaks like breaks to the point of like he can't speak he's just in shock 
That um, uh, that does bring me to a point about what a really good ending has to have a good payoff. Yeah, it has to really wrap and, things up. And, and the last boss of Xenoblade Three is not good at all. It's not even that same character; it's someone else entirely. Um, what the fuck? Yeah, because as you find out, the one who actually is in control of the world and orchestrating everything is literally a physical manifestation of anxiety. It's it's dumb. I don't. I'm really against it. I really hate every, the main villain. Every time you talk about this game, I am left more and more confused. You gotta play. You just, what you should, so what you should do is you should just fucking play it. But anyways, payoff is great though because they basically have this moment where they're like, okay, time's been frozen into a into a little bubble, right? And you finally beat the 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 villain who's holding time frozen, and they're like, well, when we do this, the universes are going to separate again um everyone has to go back to their their plane of existence because the whole point of the game is two universes collided um right anyway so they basically tell you like the universe are going to collide and by the way anyone who met and had kids in this frozen time they're going to disappear because we're going back to the second time froze so universes are going to going to divide and everyone's going away that 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 existed and so it, there's mm. kind of like this nice thing where like they basically like, you know, you could, you know, you could take the place of the villain and then the main character's like, nope, we're just going to, we're just going to let it happen. We're just going to let time naturally take its course kind of thing. Um, and it's a really great payoff because it's like, it's all about like basically just letting go of, you know, this fear of unknown and fear of wanting to keep things frozen in place. And, you know, it, it's like the whole theme of really just like, I feel like of the creators being like, we're letting this go. We've been trying to tell the story for 20, uh, you know, 25 years. Nintendo's finally given us the budget for us to let it, to end it. We're going to end it and we're just going to move on. And that's Nintendo's it. Nintendo's in the business of giving you the budget to end things. Cause that's what they did with Bayo three. And that's what they've done to, to, to come back to Bayo three, but people are not happy with how Bayo because it ends. sounds like Bayo three douched it out. <laughs> I don't know bit. what exactly douched it out means. And like they just they wrapped it up as quickly as possible, like in a low effort kind of way. Well, nothing of the game feels low effort. This game feels like they threw every fucking idea they've ever had into the game. It's right. a story wonder wise, though. Wonderful game. The story is kind of all over the place. I'll give it that, though. Like, or I'll, I'll admit that like the story is like what? Like there's definitely not enough. There's nowhere near enough satisfying narrative and it's funny because there's like more i feel like there's more cutscenes in this game maybe than some of the others but like it's still just is like there's so much what yeah. shit is just sort of like introduced and dropped and then like left well this is <laughs> the downside of narrative getting better in games is that now when narrative is sort of just like meh it stands out really bad because uh, something that i was thinking about before and we've we've already talked about this in a previous episode where we were like uh, before we used to say story in games don't matter. It's an afterthought. Mm -hmm. It's bullshit. And then we came around and we were like, ah, you know, actually, story in games is getting really good. Yeah. It does matter. And then it's like when they do something like this or when a game does something like this where it just like feels like they, the game story is all over the place or honestly, again, I, f I feel like I feel like Bayonetta 3 is in very many ways the Metal Gear Solid 4 of its franchise. Which, really? Like, because it's a globetrotting game. Well, actually, it's a multiverse. but They use it as globetrotting, even though it's technically going to different multiverses. So it's a so multiverse. there's a lot of what the fuckery, though. Right, so there's a multiverse thing, but, it, but basically what it means is you go, to, you go to a version of Tokyo that's mostly the same but slightly off. Uh, you go to China. You go to France. You go to Egypt which is really cool. Solves a huge problem I have with these character action games. And that is um, a lot of times they feel like the levels take place in like two locations at most two mm. or three, and they're very samey and things get like level lines really boring. Not the case in Bayo three. They, they love really what they kicks, did. Yeah. It kicks really, out. really okay. love what they did there. Um, but Metal Gear Solid 4 is kind of the same way. Remember, Metal Gear Solid 4 takes place like all over the globe. Everywhere. Yeah. It's like in the Middle East, PMT's it's in Europe. You yeah. go back to you go back to the Shadow um, Shadow Moses Island. Like Metal Gear 4 is all over the place. It's everywhere. And 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 you'd almost say it's overindulgent too. And and Bayo 3 is kind of overindulgent too in its gameplay, but there's definitely one big sore point. 
in Bayonetta 3 that shares with Metal Gear Solid 4. And that is Kamiya and Kojima both have no idea how to write romance. Now, to be fair, this plagues many famous authors. Um, I remember, you know, before I learned she was a transphobe, um, I remember reading the Harry Potter series and thinking, wow, this woman has no idea how to write romance. You know, wow. <laughs> very, cre very creative, right? very creative person. But holy shit, is her romance like just bad if it's there well, at all she was setting up for zillions of books so that harry and hermione were going to end up together and then at the last moment was like but what a twist <laughs> like, <laughs> like just because it's a twist and it shocks people doesn't make it good all right and, and definitely feels that way with bayonetta 3 because you know you're introduced to a character early on and if you if you pay attention even the slightest bit you're immediately going to look at her and go okay she's her daughter right um, and then she's the daughter of bayonetta and this character luca which Really like doesn't no make much setup, sense, right? <laughs> no setup, right? Okay. Exactly. Like, just it really doesn't make much sense. He shows up in the first game. He hates Bayonetta because he thinks she killed his dad. Um, so, and he's like this bumbling sidekick character who doesn't realize that it wasn't Bayonetta. It was angels that he couldn't see on a different plane of reality that killed his father. Bayonetta was actually shooting at the at the angels. Um, she's not the one who caused his father to die. Um, but he's I a bumbling so much of this story. He's a, he's a he's a bumbling sidekick, right? Angels are bad. She's a witch. Mm -hmm. Hell, good? No, hell, not good either. It's hell it's more good. that no one good in, in Bayonetta. There's there's three there's three planes: Paradiso, uh, the Realm of Chaos, which is humanity, and then Hell. And um, basically, like basically, Umbran witches keep Hell in check. By killing angels and then vice versa. And then the Lumen Sages kill demons and keep that in check. Um, it's supposed to be this balance thing. They're not supposed to interact, more or less. So, like, you have humans who kill angels, you know, they're they're Umbran, you know, there's there's humans called Lumen Sages, they kill demons. Bayonetta was the daughter of a forbidden love between a Lumen Sage and an Umbra witch. And that's why she wears hair clothes. Uh, I, guess, I think that's actually all the Umbra witches do, but that's not even really the point. The more just the point is like, okay, so Luca's this bumbling side character who basically he's there for comedy relief in the first game. Right. Completely. Same deal. He's in the second game, but has less to do. And he's just, again, more or less just some bumbling sidekick. He is, for all intents and purposes, he's Johnny Sasaki from Metal Gear Solid. You know? Okay. Um, if anyone doesn't know who that is, that's the guy who, who always has to take a shit. Yeah, um, Google Google it. He does. <laughs> he gets knocked out with his pants off all the time. Yeah, exactly. Shit like that. Um, you know, he's the one you give a stomach ache to or whatever. Um, yeah. He bumbled around and showed up in a bunch of Metal Gear Solid games as as a goofy side character. Now, Luca definitely had more screen time than Johnny Sasaki did, but he, you know, he's he's, he's basically that. So anyway, three the thing we're getting at is supposedly Luca got his fuck on with Bayo. So apparently in three, at some point in one of the one of the multiverses, Bayo and Luca hooked up and had a daughter named Viola. Um which would be fine, I guess, for some people on one end, if it was just like Viola's just from some universe where this happened. But then it's at the end of Bayonetta 3, the Bayonetta you're playing with and the Luca that's in that game basically then decide, I really do love you. I do love you too. And then like they, they basically, and they die and they, they both go to hell together at the end of the game. Um, Which is bad. I guess it's bad. Um, well, here's the thing. Personally speaking, I don't give a shit enough about these storylines in a Bayonetta or a Devil May Cry to, to be that emotionally invested in them um it, it's it's something i find weird it's a lot like frankly sonic fandom where people get real into the story of sonic right or whatever and i'm just kind of like these are just goofy ass action games like they're there for they're there for fun i don't really, i don't i spend no amount of time outside of the games thinking about the storyline and the characters of these games i love these games they're some of my favorite games but I personally just don't care that much. So people about... are mad because they have no real relationship in the games. And then all of a sudden, like they got kids uh, or a kid and people are like, but Luca's so lame and Bayonetta wears a fur bikini. Yeah. 
And this brings me to the point that I think we're both trying to make. And it's that uh, you too can be like Luca and land a hot witch if you make with the head, boys and girls. You just got to get good with your mouth. And like pretty much everyone's down with that. Like you could be super mediocre and you could land yourself like an eight or a nine easily uh, just around your head game. That's the moral of Bayonetta 3. I'm not even going to dignify that. <laughs> because you know I'm right. <laughs> you know I'm right. Head game strong. Ultimate. <laughs> like, it's, if you could back it up. <laughs> okay. So people were mad because it seemed like a like a bait and switch, right? One, it does come out right the fuck out of nowhere, right? Like, yeah. uh, especially for the Bayonetta you control in the game. Where it's like she just realizes, like you know, you're you're a clumsy fool, but I can't imagine my life with anyone else ever. I'm like, wait, you? Oh. When did what? When, how did you come to that conclusion, Bayo? Exactly. Um, well, she stumbled into it apparently. Yeah, and 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 there is a lot a lot of people who who feel like this was very much queer baiting. Now, here's the thing: I'm not I'm not gay. You're not gay, so I feel like we don't really have. I don't want to I don't want to sound like I'm speaking for things or saying like undermining things that, you know, don't affect me because I'm not I'm not there. Like I am not I'm not living this, well, this right. life well, experience. I, I but I can I, I can absolutely sympathize as someone who has played through all three games very recently. Absolutely. Um, the, the that apps Bayonetta 3's ending absolutely was queer baiting. Because at no point, one, did Bayonetta ever seem to give a single solitary fuck about Luca. Two, um, it seemed, as I learned recently, incredibly sapphic relationship between Bayonetta and Jean. Um, the silver-haired, hmm. red, pink-red wearing um, other Bayonetta-looking girl, for those who don't know. Um, All right. It, it seemed very, it didn't even seem like, it seemed like the romance had already, you know, it, it, it seemed like they weren't even, Bayonetta 1 and 2 was like past romance. Like she had amnesia in 1, but like by the end of the game, she gets her memories back. And then all throughout 2, it absolutely just feels like, oh yeah, they're they're a couple. It's not even a romance because they're already hooked up. Like it, it has that feeling. You know, they, they talk about, you know, I'll see you at home, dear. Like they literally say those lines. Huh. Like it's it's very much like no one... No one ever for a fucking second thought that Bayonetta and Jean weren't a thing, especially with the plot of two being the fact that Jean's soul gets ripped out of her body and Bayonetta literally goes to hell to rescue the soul of Jean. She literally has a Dante's Inferno, a divine comedy, um, you know, right. whole journey to, to rescue her beloved out of the clutches of hell. Now, I'm not speaking. I'm speaking as a friend of. Uh, quite a few lesbians, but we all know that the realistic thing is that as soon as she rescued John or John would then hook up with a dude. That's the lesbian experience. <laughs> you go to hell for that woman and then she goes straight. I look, you don't have to believe me. I just have a lot of lesbian friends that happen too. So <laughs> that's like a, what the fuck? I don't even know what you're talking that's about. That's the here. real lesbian experience. It wouldn't no, be, it wouldn't be, no, it is not. <laughs> it wouldn't be Bayo who it then ends up with a dude. It's, Jean it's, that it's clearly someone's idea of the experience, but no. Um, I so <laughs> <laughs> look at every, every single lesbian I know has an unrequited love story that ends that way. So with a guy, seems, yeah, we're like the girl that they bend over backwards. And it seems like they're going to end up in a relationship. And then that girl's like, oh, meet my boyfriend. It happens a lot. I don't I don't think yeah, it does. It's, it's a stereotypical <laughs> joke. I, I'm i out of the loop on it. That's terrible. <laughs> I'm out of the it's loop on it. Pretty solid. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's a pretty, it's a pretty I mean, solid I mean, in Hollywood, joke. yes. Well, wow. like. Like in in film and 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 now in gaming, I guess yeah yeah, yeah that's like, fair. But this definitely it, it definitely like, and I think that's where the term queer baiting comes from is that they baited you into thinking this was a thing, and then up oh, sorry suddenly straight, um, which right. I'll sympathize with them on this one on that, which is okay. I feel your I feel it's fair. I feel I you were. Game, so I don't. Know I feel to... like you. I, well, I feel like Bayonetta fans absolutely were tricked. I feel they they absolutely were were a bit of a bit lied to here on this one. Like just 
And again, if you look at this completely from like, I, you know, say you were quote unquote, a, like say, say you were asexual, like you don't have romance feelings, romantic feelings for, or at least sexual feelings for anyone. Right. Or anything. You could not look at Bayonetta one, two, and three, or go through one and two and go, Oh yeah. Yeah. De definitely her and that, that bumbling comic relief guy, definitely going to hook up by the end. Like, <laughs> He's just not in the games enough. He's not part of the story enough to have ever even been a consideration, which yeah, again, funny makes guys me, grow on you. It just, it just goes back to Metal Gear Solid four where, where Meryl Silverberg ends up marrying Johnny Sasaki and they have this whole wedding scene in Metal Gear Solid four. And you're like, yeah, why <laughs> that always seemed like it was supposed to just be like a nudge, nudge joke, not like Canon, but there are, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people who liked that. You remember that? That there were people that were like, oh, that's so cool. Like there was some sort of setup to that. And I don't know why anybody would be like, oh, that's great. But where? Where did that come from? It almost Nowhere. seemed, it felt like Kojima was almost like doing it as a troll. Well, that's and what I, I thought. Yeah. And I, I don't think Platinum was doing this as a troll. I think at the end of the day, what they were really trying to do was just to end Bayonetta's story. Right, yeah, they were trying to wrap it up because they Cause knew this was the last time. They literally say at the end, you know, the story, you know, the story will be continued in a new generation. Like they, they literally say that at the end of the game. Viola takes up the name Bayonetta at the end of the game and starts doing, you know, ghost hunting jobs for her or whatever. Um, the whole point of this game was basically to finish Bayonetta's story. Like I, the way I look at it is like they just. They looked at this game as like this is our gonna, probably going to be the last chance because Bayonetta two did not sell super great, didn't save the Wii U for sure, um, didn't didn't crush it on the Switch either, just did okay. Nothing could. Um, nothing. No, absolutely nothing could. So nothing could save. That. As we found out, Kamiya made a video presentation that he sent to Nintendo early 2017, like right after, sometime right after January. Uh, to Nintendo asking, you know, to do saying, here's a proposition I have for Bayonetta 3. Would you be interested? Um, and this apparently was right after Scalebound got canceled at Microsoft. And there's a yeah, lot well, that of that was a clusterfuck, right? And there's a lot of Scalebound in Bayonetta 3, by the way. Like so much kaiju shit, so much giant, giant dragon shit in this game. It's so obvious that like some whatever they, they took were, a bunch of assets or something. It's not, yeah, it really feels like that because so much of the game is built around kaiju fighting um so anyways it kind of feels like he knew that that you know i don't think at the time bayonetta one and two hadn't come out on the switch but here's a couple things that line up one nintendo said yes which is kind of crazy but this is early 2017 like the switch is just about to come out nintendo is fucking desperate for this thing to be a success after the <laughs> wii u so Nintendo's hungry, and they agree to 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 funding a Bayonetta three, and they announced it in December of 2017. Um, took a long time to get out. Um, there, there's definitely rumors about that the game actually had to restart development halfway through. Um, but it does kind of feel like Platinum was like, "We're getting one shot at this. We're getting one shot to finish this this series." So I feel like. They wanted to end the Bayonetta series, or at least this story or this character, on their own terms. Hmm. And I can appreciate that. Is it a good ending? Not really. <laughs> well, yeah, but like, so many game series just don't get an ending. But it does have an ending. It has a definitive right. ending. It's a little sloppy. It's a little. It's a. It's. It, it happens a little too quickly. Um, which is funny because I've actually recently gone through a marathon with my um with with my girlfriend all the Universal classic monster movies. Holy hell! These thirty movies they just end immediately after the monster's dead. Right. Like their climaxes are very short, and when that monster or whatever whatever main issue is taken care of, it immediately goes to the end. Yeah, you don't need to drag it out, man. It's funny almost. Um, not that this game is like that necessarily, but it does have this air of like it, they wrapped it up real fast. The, 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 the well, last boss fight is dragged out to holy hell and back. But after the, after the boss is actually finally, truly dead, 
you know, after he's done his return of the King, you know, 10 forms. Right. Um, the actual ending is like, okay, this happened pretty quickly. Wait, what? Just okay. Like a... <laughs> just goodbye. Yeah. But again, like I, it feels like they just, they wanted to end this on their terms, which I can appreciate, but I'm not going to tell you it, it, it went well. <laughs> So in contrast to that, what is a game series that like ended really solid? I haven't played it, but I'm going to say it anyways. And that's the mother series. Uh, otherwise really? known as Earthbound. Earthbound. Yeah. Uh, out here we have Earthbound Zero, Earthbound, or I'm sorry, Earthbound Beginnings, Earthbound. And we never got part three um, for the Game Boy Advance. Now, the creator owns the franchise. I don't know how that happened. I don't know what happened there where, where like he had, he somehow, I think he, it's just, I think he just knew people, right? Um, so he was able to develop a game and retain ownership of the IP. Then again, it started in the 80s, back on the NES days. It probably wasn't that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. And again, the game was never that huge anyway. So it's not like Nintendo ever tried to buy it off him. Um, but it is super beloved. You know, by the, the the twelve people who've played it, yes, yeah, it's um, like a, it, but it's a gamer cred game. You know what I mean? Like, yes, it's one of those games that, like, you, if you drop Earthbound or Mother, right? Like, people are like, oh, they're a gamer. Yeah, and, and 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 Nintendo didn't know what to do with marketing it in North America and fumbled it spectacularly. Right. But he he finished. You know, they, it was supposed to be on N sixty four. It was supposed to be in three D. It it got canceled. You know, because apparently it went through Dev Hell, and then they they retooled it, and remade, it, and made it a 2D Game Boy Advance game, which basically looks no different graphically from the Super NES game. So they're all very basic, simple looking games. They're pr they're pretty much indie games, um, more or less in scope and scale. And you know, he, he he did Mother Three, and he's like, "I'm that's it, I'm done." And I think someone even asked him about it, and he's like, "No." He, 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 I think he made some weird comparison to like music bands or something where he's like, you know, when like a music band is like they, they, they hit their peak album and then every album after that is just sort of like treading water or just doing it. He's like, right. I feel like I've said all, he basically said, I feel like I've said all I needed and wanted to say, you know, through video games. I don't want to make any more. So he's done after three. That's he's like, I fucking heard of what did he like, do I after? Just, I, you know what, I, <laughs> there was, I don't think it was him, but there was a story um, about like uh, some game developer who just decided to become like a, uh, like a hermit or a farmer, like a, like a, like a go live, like a, like a very meditation heavy life, just living Fucking off the land. Hell yeah, man. <laughs> just... I have a deep respect for that. You know, like, is it for me? I don't know, but I sort of love people that can hermit. Yeah. Um, if I ever won the lottery, I'd be gone so fast. I'd just buy a farm somewhere, fucking live my life pursuing hobbies, get really good at yoga, get bendy as fuck. <laughs> um, yeah, black. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at what he did because, mm. like, yeah, like he, um. Uh, he's an avid Monopoly player, president of the Japan Monopoly Association. Well, then he's a psychopath. So <laughs> we should be glad he's not around anymore because he's probably been murdering people for the last 30 years. He made a photo creation tool called Dokonoko, which is designed specifically to be used with pets. It's described as Instagram for pets. It's most famous for particular Japanese Labrador. That's pretty much it. He just... He just does weird shit, dude. <laughs> yeah, you know what? There's got to be there's something to be said for like getting fuck you money early in life, you know. And then just like after that, you just do what makes you happy. God, love that for him. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, he just I don't actually even know what he does. Um, his his occupation is listed as essayist. Okay, he's a writer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but it, to me, I think Earthbound is the greatest example of a series ending gracefully on its own terms, um, which only happened because he owned it. 
Right. Un- unfortunately, because and every it was only other coherent because he told the story himself. For well, every other years. video game franchise, it just like they end when they stop making money. So they always have like this really like really sad sort of like, oh right. man, this was the last game. Ugh. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5 was for a long time the last Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Thankfully, there was one and two remake, but it's one and two remake. The franchise ended on this fucking wet fart, right? Um, I, 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 I will say this. There is also the Uncharted series, sort of. So Uncharted, I was sort of going to say. It didn't really end, though. They made it didn't it really end. They just shifted it over, and they made the, the Lost Legacy with the other characters. Right. Um, uh, I was going to say that that's a pretty good one. Like it wraps yeah, up. And, and I think Earthbound is, I'm sorry, not Earthbound, but I, I think Bayonetta was trying to do what Earthbound or, or Uncharted was doing, where it's like, okay, Uncharted is like, we're done with Nathan Drake. We've ended his storyline. Boom. Done. Right? They did that flash forward. And I think that's kind of what Bayonetta was going for, where Bayonetta's story's over. There'll be a new generation, but we're, we're done with this character and this story. Uh, and I don't think fans are particularly, I, apparently the, the, the idea that like, Viola like would would take up the name Bayonetta after Bayonetta's passing like really rub people the wrong way. I don't know. Is it like a Rise well, of Skywalker it, moment? Is it now a title? Is it that that is sort of weird? Well, like Bayonetta's real name is Cereza, anyways. So <laughs> where the fuck does Bayonetta come from? Well, it's the name she gave herself when she didn't know what her name was with with them um, when she had amnesia. So what the fuck? It's a mean? title. Yes, it's really more of a title, really. Yeah, but you, it, it, you don't give yourself like Siobhan. No, you're like, hmm, I don't remember who I am. Bayo. Bayonetta. That sounds cool. I'm going with that. It's like mayonnaise, but with a bayonet. Sure. Why not? Whatever. Again, I don't <laughs> personally care that much about this franchise or characters to be like worked up about it. I just can sympathize a little bit with people. I'm like, yeah, right. this this came out of nowhere. This was a little bit of a sloppy ending. And yes, you absolutely for for the for the you know, especially for the lesbian bisexual community. I mean, I guess you could still argue she's maybe she's bisexual, but like, yeah, you definitely got queer baited on this character. Um, you got queer baited hard. Um, I do. I do sort of wonder. I mean, it it's not fair to say a one game one off game can be a good series ender. Uh, because single single time games, you know, like your rhymes and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, which never have a follow up, of course, are going to have cleaner endings. Uh, yeah. Because they're just intended from the outset. To well, have... It's even worse, though, when those games do get sequels. Like you get a game that yeah. has like, this very definitive ending. Well, that's what I was then... going to say. It's like you, ugh, hate you that. end up with prequels a lot of the time, like Red Dead 2. Yeah. Um... You and you know, it's. I was trying to think, like you know, Naughty Dog did good with Uncharted, but like, did they do good with like Last of Us Two? Are they going to do a Last of Us Three? Because Last of Us Two seemed like it was supposed to be a pretty definitive ending. You know what? Though I honestly would argue one was. One did see. Yeah, I'll, one seemed like it was. I'll still. I'll argue to this day. Like two could not have happened, and it would have been fine. Right. Like yeah. The story in any any well, two's story in... problem is it dragged on. It had like three different <laughs> That's endings. True, true. Well, I'm just saying Joel and Ellie. I mean, Ellie did get a whole lot of story in two. Don't get me wrong, but it's right. like you could have left it there at the end of one and been fine. And just two could have been about a completely different set of people in a completely different part of the world. And it would have been fine. Like the ending of one to me did not call out for a sequel. It's kind of weird to me sometimes when... I hear people like Pixar, you know, and, and, you know, uh, Mr. Mr. Hugs a lot, you know, talked about, you know, we you know at Pixar, we only do, we won't do a sequel until we have, we, we have a really great idea and we're really, mm. the idea is really good. We have to do it then. It's like really Toy Story 4, but <laughs> you well, want fucking money and That's like Monsters talking. University, like it was good but it's like i don't fucking think monsters inc sat there and called out i wanted to know what these two i want to know what john goodman and billy crystal were doing in college and i'm like just go watch meet when harry met sally jesus um <laughs> fair enough uh i do i so we're in our last few minutes here and I, I was trying to think of like maybe what's the worst what's the worst wrap up how oh, about um, 
<laughs> what? Valus. If you want to talk about the series that went the, went 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 the, the worst, it's Valus. I'm sorry. Like I know where you're going with this, right? Like what series we had it had it go the worst? I'm like it's it's Valus. Although it had a, it, it has like a happy epilogue, I guess you could say now. Um, All right. Well, that solves it. That's fine. I don't think I I can't remember Valus. You wouldn't like it's it's an obscure game that came out on the Genesis and and Turbo Graphics. There's like one on the Super NES. Um, Valis is a let me just read this to you. Valis is a platform game it's created by blah blah. It's a magical girl plot game tells the story of a Japanese school girl who's fated to protect the three realms by wielding a mystical sword known as Valis. Kind of sounds like Bayonetta, honestly. Uh, hmm. The yeah. original game Valis, the Phantasm Soldier, was developed for the PC eighty eight and ported to several other platforms. This was followed by a series of platform games releasing during the 16-bit era for various home consoles, most notably TurboGrafx-16 and the Sega Genesis. Out and then, um, I'm trying to like I'm trying to get the timeline here. Um, sometime in the in the 2000s, um, they the the owners, the copyright owners, I think it was Sunsoft or no, it was Telenet Japan. Sorry, Telenet Japan shut down and or something like that right and so they sold valis to a another developer who makes hentai games so they turned this basically castlevania like it was castlevania very ish playing game okay. right and they basically turned it into a hentai visual novel so no game had it worse than having its rights sold off to a pornography studio who then had the main character put into a visual novel where there is much non-consensual interspecies erotica going on. No one had it worse than Valis. They recently sold it again to someone who wants to like return it back to its roots, but I just <laughs> nobody got it worse than Valis. Like no matter how bad, you know, you said to George Lucas rape my child or whatever <laughs> dumb shit you want to say on Twitter or something. Nothing, nothing actually was went worse for for a, for a video game series. And if you were somehow an obscure fan of Valis, like you had this Castlevania light game, cool Castlevania and magic and fantasy, and now it's a non consensual hentai visual novel. Great, I'm so great. I, this bright. Feature. I can only hope that happens to us. <laughs> I I think that's the greatest ending to a podcast we've ever had. So I'm not even gonna. I I had I had. Oh, that was thoughts. for the 20th anniversary, that. by the way, mind you. That was the 20th anniversary game. As <laughs> it got sold to this other company, and they're like, "All right, for the 20th anniversary, we're total. We're we are literally going to show the character getting raped in a game. No and one had it worse than Valis. No one." In closing, Absolutely no one. That's not even a joke. I'm telling you, like actual facts of what happened to that poor fucking franchise. In closing, you either wrap it up like Bayonetta, or you end a hentai. <laughs> On that note, we've got dudes to thank. <laughs> I guess the question of the day is, uh, what's your favorite series wrap up? And if it's Valis, if it's Valis, we man. we. we, we you may need to talk to someone but as with, always with medical degrees we've got producers to thank if you're interested in becoming a dude at any level please check out patreon.com slash yo video games podcast dude of the week was neo meister thank you neo meister and our producers for this episode are screwnami croy 35 hyper viper 89 ziggy z and online persona thank you dudes and we will catch you next time later dudes <laughs>